I'm going to first start with the first uh, question. Despite this great message of, uh, of hope, however, the Syrian conflict looks like it's not going to end soon. Today we witnessed elections in, in Syria. The actual president is trying to renew his legitimacy, uh, which is something that might give a fresh new start for this ongoing battles. Do you have a long-term plan, especially for Lebanon, which is the only country maybe with no boundaries and no limits to hosting the influx of Syrian refugees? Well, you know, I, um, I know that it, it, it looks... Uh, it looks very bleak right now. But what, what I wanted to share, and, and specifically the reason I wanted to come here is because, um, uh, you know, my parents also lived through the war. Uh, my father was a refugee himself, and he crossed the border from North Korea to South Korea at the age of 19, and then never saw his family again. My mother uh, had to flee and um, uh, uh, you know, lost her mother during the war. And so I have some sense of what it's like to live in these kinds of situations. And on the one hand, it builds a tremendous sense of resilience. And uh, one of the things that uh, has been most striking to me in meeting uh, so many um, uh, Lebanese people is this incredible resilience built up from years of, of, uh, of facing conflict. Uh, uh, my sense uh, being here is that there are just tremendous resources here in Lebanon. There are especially human resources. There is an incredibly well-educated population. And there is far more optimism than I had expected to find. And so uh, specifically what we're saying is we've got to, as a global community, step up right now and support the efforts uh, to deal with the influx of refugees. And, and again, uh, for us, we think that um, there are very specific programs that are already working that can be scaled up. Um, there's still a great need to support the UN and, and uh, uh, its ability to, to, to uh, administer directly to the refugees. But the other thing we're saying is let's prepare for the day when there's peace. Let's think about what we need to do now to, to lay the groundwork for the kind of prosperity and growth that we know that the Lebanese people want. And there are still things to do. There are still reforms in energy and water, transport, uh, and uh, uh, telecommunication. There are things that we need to do right now. And I had the great opportunity to meet with, uh, with the Prime Minister and his cabinet today. And I'm convinced that uh, they're committed uh, to, to taking the legislation that needs to be taken forward. Uh, I, I know that they're committed to it. And uh, I... Uh, I'm here as the first World Bank president to be here in 14 years so that I can then go to the rest of the world and send this message. We've got to help right now, but this is, is a great country with a great future, with the fantastically educated young people uh, who want a chance uh, to grow and live in peace. And, and, and frankly, after all that this country has done for the Syrian refugees, I feel that we as a world community owe it to the Lebanese people. Well, Dr. Kim, since 1992, the World Bank Group has been helping Lebanon, giving technical assistance and recommendations. However, until now, we feel that there should be like an, an, I don't know, a fresh new look for these recommendations because some, there is obstacles to implement those recommendations. Are you going to have a new approach when it comes to dealing with Lebanon? Well, we, we do, and we're, and we're in the middle of doing that right now. We're in the middle of preparing a new partnership framework uh, for, for Lebanon. And, uh, you, you know, just for, just for the sake of the students, in 1992, when the relationship started, um, I was part of a movement uh, called 50 Years is Enough. And uh, it was on the, the 50th anniversary of the World Bank. And I was a little bit older than most of you, uh, but I went to Washington, D.C., and uh, stood outside and protested against the World Bank, uh, calling for it to be closed on its 50th anniversary. So um, I know a little bit about what it's like to be a student activist. Uh, I was actually a little older than being a student, but uh, uh, I was very critical of the World Bank in those days. But I have to tell you, the World Bank has changed a lot. And I also um, realized that uh, some of my criticisms uh, uh, weren't necessarily well-founded. Well Look, the World Bank today um, is an organization that's really focused on bringing the best knowledge, innovations from all over the world and bringing them to any country that's a member, including Lebanon. And so whatever problem uh, you and your leaders decide is, that you want to focus on, we're now 
in our newly organized structure going to be able to bring you the best innovations from Latin America, from uh, East Asia, uh, from all over the world, from Africa, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and bring them here to Lebanon and help you implement these programs. But there are such astounding innovations that are happening all over the world. We want to be that organization that brings those innovations right here to Lebanon. I'm sure the students are eager to ask their questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to line up, please, those who have questions on these microphones on both sides. As you just mentioned, one of the main aims of your visit is to present a proposal to fund an electricity project in Lebanon. Now, this plan is supposed to be implemented in less than 10 years in order to help Lebanon ease the burden from the general debt. Could you please tell us some specifics about the plan and the repayment? Because as I've read, it's supposed to be a loan and with low interest. So are we supposed to see this as just another short-term solution, but it, that is also a delayed burden? Or just a bit about this, please. Thank you. Right. So I, you know, we have a team here. I, don't, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you all the specific details of the specific plan. But let me just tell you generally uh, how we work. Uh, so um, uh, uh, we have a long history of, uh, of being an extremely reliable financial institution and we're, we have the best AAA rating, one of the best AAA ratings in the world. So the way that we do our business is that we borrow at a very, very low rate and we also lend at a, at a, at a relatively very low rate. And in addition, we provide free technical assistance so that uh, these projects actually get done. Now. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a very, very small grant window that we only provide for the very poorest countries, the countries that literally um, uh, are, you know, on the edge of survival. So uh, we have found over time that because our interest rates are so low and because our ability to help people actually achieve uh, success in this project is so good, that it's really a good investment on the part of a country. And we believe that about the plan for electricity. And, and so um, we're very committed. And uh, we know that uh, all over the world, um, the, the demand for electricity, for energy, is going to continue to grow. And so we're now uh, all over the world trying to promote several things. One is we're committed that no matter how poor a country might be, we think they have a right to, to energy. And, and, and uh, 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 therefore, you know, we're working with countries all over the world to try to provide energy. But we also are trying to do it in the cleanest possible way. And uh, you know, sometimes we're not. We're gonna. We're, there's going to be many instances where we still have to use fossil fuels, but we're now looking to try to to uh, uh, bring solar, wind, hydroelectric power to many more places in the world. And so I, you know, we're very excited about this project. We think that it can provide electricity, and at a rate and under conditions that uh, Lebanon can more than than meet over time. Right. Let's take from the second question from this side. Now my question is about the effect of the Syrian refugees uh, in Lebanon. The number of the Syrian refugees is uh, equivalent to over than a quarter of the Lebanese citizens. Now my question is, I have read that uh, the World Bank contributed to over than 150 million to Jordan and uh, on the other hand only 10 million to Lebanon and which caliber this was made. And my other question is uh, what uh, the World Bank is taking as measures to encourage donations from all over the world to Lebanon in this matter. Thank so you. So what are the criteria? Yes. <coughs> well, well, so we, we, it, that, that's, not, that's not the correct number as far as I understand. We have been uh, making uh, very enormous investments in Lebanon as a whole for a very long time. And uh, we are pushing the limits of what we can do in terms of supporting uh, Lebanon. But uh, let me, let me um, uh, uh, tell you about our overall efforts. So um, last year, the, the, the Lebanese government asked us to put together a report uh, really detailing what the impact has been of uh, the influx of Syrian refugees. And what we showed was that uh, unemployment rates uh, have doubled. We also showed that as of last summer, the total losses to the economy were around $7.5 billion. So we were part of the very first meeting at the UN uh, calling for the support of donors. And so um, we're doing it again, and that's why I'm, I'm here. Again, we, you know, we, we have very clear sort of rules and regulations about what we can do. We've actually provided uh, 8.2 million dollars in pure grant aid to um, uh, the, the, the re refugee effort, but then there are many other programs that are focused right now on supporting the Lebanese government so they can respond. 
Uh, we have a multi-donor trust fund that, that uh, we've just put together. Uh, and and uh, I just had a meeting with, uh, with uh, all of the donor community here in Lebanon and, uh, and directly uh, asked them to increase their donations. And when I go back, I will also um, be uh, 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 talking with donor countries all over the world to try to get them to invest in this multi-donor trust fund, which we think is a very good and, uh, and new instrument that can, um, uh, that can be very helpful in, in, in supporting the government. Since we tackled this issue, why is the international aid is not forthcoming to Lebanon? Well, I think part of it is that um, there are just a lot of conflicts in a lot of parts of the world right now. And um, uh, I, I, um, uh, right now, um, uh, the, the most reliable donor countries are only n just now coming out of a, of a financial crisis that has lasted for quite a long time. The European countries are just now returning to growth. And so there has been, uh, there's been uh, so many uh, other pressing needs that I think we've taken our eye off the ball in terms of Lebanon just a bit. And you know, again, what I, what, what I want to stress is that um, when I go back to Washington and when I meet with other uh, leaders, I'm going to really stress the point that, that this country has accepted the most refugees and we really need to support Lebanon. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that in the region governments are spending more than 5% of the GDP in education, but we know it's not about the quantity but about the quality. So what is the role of the World Bank to improve the economic situation, not, not only of the countries but of the youth? and how to improve the educational system, not in quantity but in quality, in Lebanon and, all, and the Middle East. The problem of youth unemployment is not unique to Lebanon or the Middle East. Uh, you, you know, we see youth unemployment rates uh, hovering around 50% even in uh, um, you know, European countries. So uh, it's a big issue. Even in, in, uh, in the, my, the country of my birth in, in South Korea, 80% um, of high school graduates go to college, which is probably more than, than really the economy can absorb. And what we're seeing now is very high rates of unemployment among uh, recent college graduates, even in Korea, even in China. So this is a problem uh, uh, globally. Uh, I, you know, I, I um, have been a professor um, for most of my adult life. I ran a, a university at one point. And um, one of the things that we haven't done is we haven't been very practical about trying to understand how young people learn. And so uh, what happens is that most universities are focused on research. We're very good at doing research and getting out papers and telling you th that one thing is statistically significantly different from something else. We're very good at that. But when you talk to the best professors, what's your understanding of the, of the neuronal mechanisms by which young people learn? Most people don't have any idea and it turns out that we now know a lot about that. We know a lot about how students learn and about how to present information in ways that maximize learning, but very few universities actually utilize that knowledge. And this is something that I discovered uh, when I was president of an Ivy League school. I mean, we, we kept asking, so do we use this knowledge? And it turns out we don't. So this is a problem everywhere. And so what we're trying to do, and again, this is my personal commitment to the region, to Lebanon. I had the same discussion with, uh, with leaders in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're, we're developing um, a, 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 a group which will focus on how to bring the latest evidence from science, from psychology, and bring it to schools so that they can maximize the ability of young people to learn. You know, um, uh, there's just some things like, for example, uh, uh, having a professor stand in a room like this and lecture on physics, it doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. But the vast majority of the best universities in the world still do that, right? So evidence is not catching up with our actual practice. So the good news is that the countries that commit and come to us and say, okay, we're going to revolutionize our educational system, we're going to look at the data, and we're going to implement it now, they have a chance to bypass some of the most uh, respected universities because it's very hard to get uh, professors who mostly focus on research to really um, completely rethink the way they teach. So this is what we hope can happen here. Uh, I've made my personal commitment, I've made the offer, and I hope to, to work with leaders here and throughout the region so that the Middle East can begin preparing their students to compete in the, in the global marketplace. You know, 80% in a country like Korea going to a four-year college is probably not the right number. Germany has a system that's very well uh, tailored to its own uh, economy, and only 40% 
go to four-year college, and, and, and the vast majority of others go to these wonderful vocational and technical schools where they learn great skills. There is going to have to be some kind of realism about what kind of education you have. And the great news for us is that we have the experts now, and we have, we're connected to all of them in the world. We're going to really make an effort to help here. In developing countries, uh, more than 90% of all jobs are created in the private sector. Yeah. So we have to have a very robust private sector strategy. We have a great private sector team here. Uh, Lebanon happens to be blessed with uh, wonderful business professionals. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, part of it is creating the jobs. We're going to focus on that. Um, the, 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 our support comes in many different forms. We provide loans to uh, organizations that want to work in the private sector. We make investments directly in the private sector. Uh, and we would also provide loans here. IDA, by the way, is not a, is not a grant. It's a, it's a loan as well, mm -hmm. but it's zero interest and it's paid off over many years. So um, it, it will be in the form of loans, but we're going to focus very much on developing uh, the entrepreneurial capacity and the space for entrepreneurialism here in, in Lebanon. So what do we need to do? Part of it's policy. There are ways to improve policy to make it easier for small and medium enterprises to grow. We, we'll work with the country on that. But also, it's actually uh, uh, directly working in the private sector to uh, provide financing and make bets on what we think are the most promising uh, opportunities for, um, uh, uh, for creating jobs in Lebanon. Uh, I wanted to ask how you can recommend integ uh, integrating women and, uh, into the public sector. At the same time, you also promote uh, working with the private sector and the private sector's growth in the shadow of a weak state that cannot, uh, is unable or unwilling to provide quotas for women. Uh, what we try to do is specifically focus on programs that will increase women's participation. Now, you're seeing uh, a realization. One of the things we've been doing is calculating um, the amount of GDP growth that people are losing by not including women. You know, Japan, a very advanced country, Prime Minister Abe uh, at, a, at a meeting in, uh, in Davos uh, this past winter said that they're losing so much GDP growth because of the non-participation of women that they're going, through, they're going to go through a fundamental reshaping of their society to make it more possible for women to participate. Now, I think uh, the, what we're going to try to do is to continue to give good examples from how the participation of women led to not only more economic growth, uh, but to more stable, more productive societies. We will keep giving that example, and for every country that's interested, um, uh, we will support them in their efforts. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to have global programs. For example, we're trying to increase uh, access to financial services, and especially focusing on women. We have a women's entrepreneurship program with Goldman Sachs. We're uh, doing more and more, and we're going to do even more, because this is critical uh, for every society in the world. Every society in the world could benefit from having greater participation of women. I couldn't help but wonder all the time, what are you doing in this, in this position? <laughs> but let's hope that you're going to bring optimism and hope to the 188 countries. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, and I hope to see you again in Beirut. Thank you. Th these were great questions, tough questions. Uh, and I come out of this session with even more, um, uh, more informed optimism for the future of Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.